following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So many people come to uh, Gnostic studies uh, because we are disillusioned or dissatisfied with, with this life. Something inside of us urges us to seek something more. And this, this inner urging, this inherent dissatisfaction, allows us to, to stop, to step outside the, the hustle and bustle of the world and to, to question why we are here, to yearn for something other than what our, our, our friends and our, our advertisers tell us we should want, and to put the constant grasping and striving of life aside just for a little while so we can step back and observe who we are, where we are, and wonder why we are here. And many of us come, many of us seek because we've concluded that this life, this world, cannot offer us what we know in our soul that we need. And so we're willing to make sacrifices in this life in order to put our hopes in the beyond. Now, in the teachings of Tsongkhapa, who was a, a Tibetan Buddhist master who lived... Um, in the, the 14th century AD. Um, people with this kind of attitude are called uh, persons of small capacity. And um, that's not meant to be an insult. Being a person of small capacity is, is, a, is a, a good attitude to have. It means putting your interest in your present life secondary and allowing uh, an interest in your next life to, to take precedent in your, uh, in, your, in your priorities. And this sort of foundational attitude is necessary for any type of, of real spiritual uh, work to, to take root. Um, most people in the world have not even cultivated this level of, of capacity yet. Uh, most of us are sort of teetering between uh, small capacity and, and zero capacity. Uh, and many religions in the world, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but many religions in the, in the world struggle to get people to value even uh, going to heaven over, over sinning today, even though they exaggerate the benefits of heaven or the, or the pains of hell by saying that, the, that, that heaven or hell are, are, are permanent, and sort of just to try to induce people into just valuing something other than, than, than immediate sensual pleasures, and they still have a hard time doing that. Um, so 
we manifest this, this mental attitude, this, this attitude of, of, a, of a small capacity by uh, engaging in good deeds and cultivating good karma because uh, the foundation for any type of, any type of birth, uh, be it a good birth or, or a bad birth, is, um, is, is karmic conditions. And so any, uh, the future rebirth that we have is based on the, 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 the karmic conditions and the actions that we set in motion today. And this is an absolutely essential part of the path. Uh, we need healthy and, and useful bodies in order to walk the path of initiation. And performing good works is necessary for this. And uh, just in, in, in case you're, you're curious, like the... The birth with, this, with the solar bodies, the second birth that we always talk about, is classified in, in this category. Uh, it's a type of birth that arises based on uh, performing good works. In, in this case, uh, that, that would be uh, alchemy. And there are bodies that are, are necessary for, for, for uh, walking this path. And so uh, a person uh, seeking to... Uh, uh, develop the second birth uh, with, the, with the solar bodies would be a, pers uh, a person of uh, small capacity, which is good. However, that's only part of the path. And in Gnosis, we're seeking something even more profound than just a, a favorable or, or pleasurable uh, uh, rebirth. We're seeking freedom from the cycle of birth and death entirely. That's, that's ultimately what this path is for. Because we understand that every state that we can find ourselves in, as long as it is part of conditioned reality, is impermanent. And so is, in, is inherently unsatisfactory. Kander Goman says in his letter to a student, you who whirl constantly in cyclic existence, yet who enter a happy realm mistaking mere calm for happiness, will certainly wander helplessly through hundreds of like and unlike realms. And so... This understanding that we have of the nature of our reality is that even if we were to enter into a, a happy kind of, of rebirth, into a happy realm, this is only a temporary shelter from the storm of suffering and cyclic existence. And that no state as long as that state is in samsara, is in cyclic existence, and as long as that state is part of conditioned reality, and so arises only because of causes and conditions, and is only sustained so long as those causes and conditions exist to sustain it. No state, no conditional state, can ever be permanent can ever be lasting and can ever bring us the lasting happiness that we yearn for. And so, from this foundation of a, of a small capacity, this foundation of recognizing that this present life is dukkha, is suffering, is insufficiency, and being willing to put the present life aside in order to cultivate something higher, something greater. We seek to move to the level of, uh, of a medium capacity, in the words of Tsongkhapa. He says in the Lam Rim, you must train in the attitude of a person of medium capacity. Why? Because even were you to reach the level of a deity or a human, you would be mistaken if you believe this 
to be pleasurable by nature. Since you would still have not escaped the suffering of conditionality, having your consciousness conditioned. Therefore, in reality, you would have no happiness whatsoever. Your life would still come to a bad end, for you would surely fall into a miserable realm again. A human or divine lifetime is like resting on a precipice just before falling into the abyss. And so this attitude of a medium capacity is a, a disenchantment with all of cyclic existence. And so even with a favorable rebirth, and most of us here, if we're honest with ourselves, will recognize that we currently have a very, very favorable rebirth compared to most of the, the, the living creatures on this planet, even most of the humans on this planet. Because we have the time, the leisure to listen to these teachings. We have access to the Dharma. We have enough of our physical needs met in order to be able to Set them aside for a little while to cultivate a, a spiritual practice. And there are even more favorable rebirths than ours. You could be born in a, in a heaven or in nirvana. But as long as we are born into conditioned existence, our state cannot last forever. And when the conditions for our happy lifetime are exhausted, when we finally used up the good karma that allowed our present state to exist, then that lifetime too will come to an end, even in the heavenly realms. And Samuel and Viewer understood how critical this situation was. Because he had been born with the solar bodies. He had the second birth. But he said, what is most terrible is I had already achieved the second birth. And I comprehended very well that if I did not achieve death within myself, I would fail by converting myself into an abortion of the cosmic mother. Into a Hasna Moose with a double center of gravity. It seemed at that time that my efforts were useless. I was failing the ordeals. And if I continued like that, it is clear that complete failure would have been inevitable. And so Samuel recognized and taught his disciples over and over again that having this rebirth, but not freeing yourself from the conditions of cyclic existence, which is the ego. So achieving the rebirth without radical psychological death is to be a failure. And so we're going to look today at one particular approach to understanding the conditioning of the consciousness and, and, and what the ego is and what binds us into this cyclic existence. In the verse summary of the perfection of wisdom in 8,000 lines, it says, those whose minds are attached to cyclic existence will continue to wander there constantly. And so this purpose that we have of uh, attempting to free ourselves from conditioning, from cyclic existence, is thwarted by this feature that pervades almost our whole psychology, 97% of who we are, which is desire. And it is deep-rooted and causes us to continually be bound to cyclic existence because the exterior is a manifestation of the interior. 
And so long as we have ego, desire inside, the exterior that we manifest, the world that we live in, we'll be conditioned by that. And we will be stuck cycling from realm to realm to realm. So Sankapa says, From beginningless time, you have been conditioned to believe that the wonders of cyclic existence are sources of happiness, and you have habitually projected upon them a false image of beauty. But if, as a remedy, you train yourself to meditate on suffering and unpleasantness, you will put an end to these wrong ideas. Kandra Goman says that if you neglect to meditate on these, ignorance and attachment will increase. And you will fuel the, the process of cyclic existence. Hence, it is vitally important to meditate on the faults of cyclic existence. And we need to meditate on this. Because most of us can see on an intellectual level that cyclic existence has some undesirable properties. But yet, this thing we have called desire inside ourselves causes us to project this false image on it, to see it as beauty, to see it as happiness, to see it as something that it is not. And so we crave it, we covet it anyways. Now this meditating on, on suffering does not mean we have to be miserable. We're not trying to create a, a, a whole society of Debbie Downers here. You don't need to be a pessimist. Rather, we're only trying to cultivate a deep cognizance of the, of the nature of our experiences. So that we stop looking outside for happiness. We stop trying to squeeze happiness out of external sensory perceptions, like squeezing water out of a stone. There's no water in the stone. And so the purpose here is to dispel the false images that we have associated with virtually everything in our life. Beauty, it fades. It's subjective. Any idea of security that we may crave after, because we all crave security, is, it, but it's completely, completely illusory. Nothing in cyclic existence is certain. You can die from a bug bite. From a teddy bear. We crave approval and fame. But these things come and go. And most of these, these things that we crave, we associate them with sensory perceptions. But really, they exist only in our head. As our own mental, mental frameworks. Our mental perceptions of, of how others perceive us. Or our mental perceptions of... of who and what we are. So we develop this, this, this sense of self, this sense of I, that we call the ego. And we think this is me. And we defend it with our lives. Maybe many people do defend the ego with their lives. You insult them, they resort to violence. Risking their, their, their physical health. Their safety. Many people will even kill themselves. Because their ego is, 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 is in pain. So looking at this study the other... Um, a few weeks ago. I was saying that... Uh, Science is getting very good at, at, at curing many of the diseases 
that have, have afflicted our, our, uh, our society, our organism. But for the new generations, people in their, their teens, their 20s, maybe early 30s, the death rate isn't going down. Because even though they're less likely to die from all of these, these, these natural phenomena, the rates of suicide is skyrocketing. The rates of drug overdose is skyrocketing. And so even though we're developing the capacity to cure ourselves of external uh, afflictions, we're still dying because we're afflicting ourselves, causing harm to ourselves. There's a lot of misery that has got to go through a person. A lot of internal pain that they must be experiencing in order to drive them to want to destroy their physical body. That's scary. That's happening even in a, in a, in a privileged nation like America where you'd think that people would, would be happy with their, or their state in life. But no, the rate of suicide is going up, up, up. It's very frightening. <clears throat> so Kapal goes on. He says, unless you reflect on the truth of suffering to the point of actually becoming revolted by psychic existence, your desire to attain liberation will be mere words. And whatever you do will lead to origins of further suffering. And even in the Gnostic movement, many students do not place their hopes in the, the final liberation, but rather we're, we're, we're aiming towards some sort of, of, of intermediate state. Oh, I'll be happy if, if, I, uh, if I become a master, or if I can enter nirvana, or I get selected to get born in, in, the, in the next root race, and then I can, can look at all those peasant elementals, and they'll look at me like I'm a god. Or I'll get abducted by the aliens, right? And they'll, they'll fly me away in, the, in their, their UFO. And then I'll watch from the, from the spaceship as all those sorry saps who are left behind destroy themselves in some sort of weird con, uh, conflagration of, of a nuclear holocaust and global, global warming. And I'll be waving at them as I'm flying away saying, who's laughing now, suckers? <laughs> and so, and so we, 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 we place our hopes in all these sorts of like weird intermediate states. Like, oh, I'll be happy if I can get this, right? And we lose sight of the goal, which is to free ourselves from cyclic existence entirely. And so aiming towards any of these, these intermediate states as, as the end goal, because in our subconsciousness, that's what, we're, that's what we're shooting for, only leads to further suffering. If you develop a sense of self, around being or becoming a master, that's, that's painful because that sense of self is inherently illusory. Even if you enter nirvana, you, 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 uh, you, you join the, the, the spiral path, you can still fall again. Or you can be born in the next root race. Many people covet that. But even that is still temporary. Even that lifetime will come to an end. Now, all these things are important. There's nothing wrong with any of these intermediate states. And future lives or future bodies are necessary, or probably necessary, for completing the work. Most of us are not going to resurrect in this lifetime. And even Song Kapa explains that we need to cultivate bodies that are useful for the process of attaining liberation. And the solar bodies are a part of that. But bodies, any type of body, be it physical, spiritual, any dimension, is just a means to an end. It's a tool, a vehicle to be used. But the problem arises when we make those the goal. And we form a, a desire, a sense of self around these conditioned states. Because then we can become 
identified with, with spiritual achievements the way that we often become identified with physical achievements. So to covet bodies, to covet any type of rebirth, is just to shift the object of our desire from temporal, physical things to temporary, spiritual things. From physical ambition to spiritual ambition. And these are ultimately just another form of suffering. And like anything that arises due to karma, the conditions that give rise to them will eventually be exhausted. And they'll eventually come to an end. Sankapa goes on. Unless you reflect on the origin of suffering until you have a good understanding of the root of cyclic existence, which is karma and the afflictions, you will be like an archer who does not see the target. You will miss the essential points of the path. You will mistake what is not a path to freedom from cyclic existence for the path and exhaust yourself without result. So let me tell you what the path is not. The path is not attaining things in this life. That should be obvious. It's not performing good deeds for a good rebirth. It's not meditation or doing mantras, or runes, or bowing, or walking. It's not coming to the Gnostic school, or the church, or the temple, or the synagogue. It's not giving donations. It's not teaching or spreading the teachings. It's not worshiping or praying, and it's not having spiritual experiences with masters or angels, etc., etc. Now, don't mistake me. All these things are good. All these things are useful. Well, most of them are. But that's not the essential nature of the path. The essential nature of the path is renunciation. It's death. And so we need good work. So we need practices like meditation and mantras and runes, transmutation, sexual alchemy. We need good works in order to acquire the energy and the tools necessary to walk the path. in order to perform this act of, of renunciation on deeper and deeper levels of our psychology. However, if we do not perform all these good works in the context of removing the afflictions, that is, desire, aversion, and ignorance, then they will never ultimately flee us from, free us from cyclic existence. We need to use all these tools in the context of freedom from suffering and awakening and liberating the consciousness. He concludes, finally, if you fail to understand the need to eliminate suffering and its origin, you will also fail to recognize the liberation that provides relief from suffering and its origin. Hence, your interest in liberation will be a mere conceit or a, a fanciful idea. And this is the state that most of us find ourselves in. Most people in the world want to be happy. But we're attached to our suffering. We don't want to eliminate it. There's this old saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And so, because of this, the path becomes obscured. And when we see the path, when we see the death of the ego, we recoil in terror not recognizing that this is the remedy we need. And when we look around the world today, we find that recognizing the path is very difficult for many people. And there's a lot of confusion and obscuration. <clears throat> and people are following paths 
Because what we're told by our parents or our elders, because of what we read, read in a book, because of what our friends or neighbors are doing, or even just what our desires and, or, or ambitions want. And because we lack a cognizance of what a path to liberation is trying to accomplish and how it is actually meant to accomplish that, the road and the destination are both obscured. How is blindly following a tradition supposed to eliminate the causes of suffering? Hmm? How is bottling the mind up in beliefs about anything, even holy things, supposed to eliminate the causes of suffering? Your suffering is not caused by your beliefs. You change your beliefs, you still suffer. How is doing any sort of practice to harness and transmute energy supposed to eliminate the causes of suffering unless we somehow utilize that energy to free our consciousness? And so we all want to stop suffering. But we don't know how because we fail to recognize what is actually causing our suffering. And even though we have an idea of what would make us happy, that's all it is, usually. A conceit, a fanciful idea. Lots of people have this idea about it, enlightenment. Oh, I'm going to achieve enlightenment. But most people have this, uh, they think about enlightenment, they say like, oh, I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to be enlightened, but I'm still going to be me. I'm just going to be an enlightened me. And so they, 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 they attach this, this idea of the ego and pollute their concept of enlightenment. Pollute their concept of liberation by saying, it's, I'm still going to have this ego in, in my liberated state. I'm still going to have this sense of self. I'm still going to be me. And so all of these, these, these strange ideas that we have lead us towards walking towards a direction that is not true liberation. These things do not lead to the elimination of suffering because they don't eliminate the causes of suffering. Sankapa says, the desire to relieve the suffering of thirst is based on seeing that you do not want to be tormented by thirst. Likewise, the desire to attain liberation, which relieves the suffering of the aggregates appropriated by karma and the afflictions, is based upon seeing that the appropriated aggregates are flawed insofar as they have suffering as their nature. And unless you develop a determination to reject cyclic existence through meditating on its faults, you will not seek relief from the suffering of the appropriated aggregates. Now the aggregates here, when he says appropriated aggregates, the aggregates, it's, uh, that's the, the Sanskrit skandhas. You, you might have heard that word before. It means uh, form, feeling, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness. It's the... Uh, it's basically the five lower bodies on, on the tree of life. It's your, your, like your physical body, your, your, your vital body, your astral body, your mental body, causal body. Right? So these vehicles that we use, the, the physical body and the other vehicles that we, that, we, uh, that we utilize, are called the skandhas in Buddhism. And the appropriated aggregates are just these bodies, under the service of the ego. And so our emotions have been appropriated by the ego. Our thoughts, our will, have been appropriated by the ego. And are being utilized for the purposes of the ego. And so 
we must first understand that the ego is causing us suffering. And this is difficult to do because we're caught up in this illusion that the ego is the actual source of our happiness. And that's why when the ego says, go do this, every time it says that, we still believe it, and we still go do that. And then we end up hurting. And again and again, we, we, we experience this, and again and again, we still go do that thing that we know is bad for us. And the 400 stanzas, it says, how can one who is not disenchanted with this world appreciate peace? Cyclic existence, like home, is difficult to leave behind. And so we even build our images of heaven around this idea of sensory pleasures. And in... Uh, in the culture, in society, we often see these ideas of heaven as being these wonderful paradises with castles and, and gold and, and, and banquets and, and, and all these sensory things that we think will please us. Because this attachment to sensory pleasures has infected even our understanding of what happiness is. And so even our, our future projections of happy state all seem to resemble cyclic existence. And so the trajectory of our work is just carrying us towards more cyclic existence, more samsara. And Samuel and Vior explain this difficulty of leaving this sense of self behind. In the magic of the runes, he says, he described an experience that he had. While in the absence of the eye and beyond time, I experienced that which is the reality, the element that radically transforms. To vividly experience the reality beyond the mind. To experience in a direct way that which is not from time. Certainly is something impossible to describe with words. I was in that state that is known in the oriental world as nirvikalpa samadhi. Being an individual, I had passed beyond any individuality. I felt for an instant that the drop was becoming lost within the ocean that has no shores. The sea of indescribable light, the bottomless abyss, the Buddhist void filled with glory and happiness. How can the illuminated void be defined? How can that which is beyond time be described? Thus, the samadhi became extremely profound, the absolute absence of the I, the complete loss of individuality, the greater and greater radical impersonalization caused fear in me. Yes, fear. I was afraid of losing what I was, my own particularity, my human affections. What a terrible thing is the Buddhist annihilation. So, filled with fright and even terror, I lost that ecstasy. I entered time. I bottled up myself within the eye. I fell into the mind. Then, woe is me. Whoa, whoa, it was then that I comprehended the inconvenient joke of the ego. The ego was the one who was suffering. It was afraid of its life. It was crying. Satan, the myself, my beloved ego, caused the loss of my samadhi. What a horror, if I had known before. But the people adore their eye too much. 
they qualified it as divine and sublime. Certainly how mistaken they are. Poor humanity. And so sick existence like home is difficult to leave behind. We've made our home within the ego, within this sense of self that we've cultivated since beginningless time. And we're all attached to it. And we're so conditioned to operating with this sense of self that to be without it is terrifying. It was terrifying even for someone like Samuel and Vior. And so we justify and fortify this sense of self because we're afraid of losing it. We're afraid of it getting damaged, of it getting questioned. And we believe the lie that this house of sludge that we've built for ourselves is somehow making us happy. That this pile of dung is a palace. And so, we have to learn to understand the nature of the lies of the ego. And so, here's one of those types of lies. So, Kapai explains, As you pass through cyclic existence, close relatives such as your father and mother become enemies in other lifetimes. Well, enemies become close relatives. Similarly, your father becomes your son, and your son your father, and your mother becomes your wife, and your wife your mother. And since there is nothing but a succession of transformations, there is nothing you can count on. And so a lot of us, we develop an attachment to our families. So like, oh, I have to be loyal to, uh, to the, the people in my family. And then the people we, 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 we see suffering on other people. Strangers. We don't give a second thought to them. But those strangers could have been your family before. Your mother or your father or your sister or your son. <clears throat> and yet... Because in this life they happen to not be born with a, a blood relationship to you. <clears throat> you don't give them a second glance. They pass out of your attention. And those people who now we, we hold so dear to ourselves... Could in the next life, in some other circumstances, be people who are completely indifferent to us. A lot of times it doesn't even have to wait until the next life. People you, become, you were friends with can become your enemies. Someone who is your spouse could become someone hated by you. You were divorced. And someone who was previously your enemy could, if the circumstances changed just a little bit, become your friend. Many times the people that we have some sort of animosity towards, it's just as a result of uh, some type of minor mental suffering that we have. At the time. And when that suffering is dissolved, there's no more animosity. I have a friend who uh, uh, was expressing some anger towards, towards another individual. Saying, well, this guy is a, is a jerk. Right? When previously he was close friends with that guy. And the only reason he was saying these terrible things about, the, about his, his, his friend was because his friend had, uh, had, had forgotten the password to his, his, uh, his wireless router. And this guy, he wanted to receive the password. And so as this, just this, this very 
tiny scenario, I forgot the password, was enough to turn a friend into an enemy. And so all things in the conditioned universe, our interpersonal relationships, and, and everything else for that matter, it's impermanent. The Buddha taught that there were only three eternal things, space, karma, and nirvana. And all other things must come to an end. All other things are subject to change. And so the ego tries to convince us that we can acquire this thing, develop this relationship with this person, get this degree, get this job, this house, the car, move to a particular place, establish ourselves in a, in a particular state, and somehow that's going to make us happy. And yet most of the times, none of us are cognizant of the fragile foundations upon which our reality rests. Most of the, the, the situations that we have in life are more fragile than a house of cards. The slightest perturbation could cause everything to collapse. It could be we receive some illness. Maybe the stock market dips a few points and, and our wealth is destroyed. Maybe someone who we depend on dies from some condition. Many, many things. A tiny thing could easily upset the balance of our lives and throw us into turmoil. And yet we still believe this lie that we can develop some type of security by acquiring, by establishing ourselves in some sort of, uh, in some sort of state. So in Kapas says, Pleasant feelings experienced by beings in cyclic existence are like the pleasure felt when cool water is applied to an inflamed boil or carbuncle. That's just a really big boil. As the temporary feeling fades, the pain reasserts itself. And so we're constantly looking to reestablish themselves, establish ourselves in, in this, this feeling of pleasure. We're constantly reaching, grasping for the next state. And this is a never-ending cycle. In the friendly letter from Nagarjuna, he says, Each of us has drunk more milk than would fill four oceans. Yet in those in cyclic existence who act as ordinary beings are intent on drinking still more than that. And so he's pointing out to us that not only are pleasures impermanent, which we were just talking about, but also they're not satisfying. When you think about all the lifetimes that you've been through and all the different experiences that you've had over millions, trillions of lifetimes, as many, many, many different types of organisms, as a rock, as a plant, many different lifetimes as, as an animal or a human, and all the different things you've experienced, you would think that by now we'd have gotten tired of it. But no, no, we haven't. We still want to do it again. Even having experienced all these things, we still have this craving inside of us, intent on continuing to repeat 
All these scenarios. And even, even if you can't remember those previous experiences, you can certainly remember this life. And in this life, I'm sure, you've come to the understanding that you've acquired certain things in life, things that you thought would make you happy, and then after acquiring them, the thirst was still not quenched. There was still something more, something beyond. Something more to covet. So Sankapa says, even if you gained all the vast wonders of cyclic existence, they would still be illusory. Now, there's several senses in which he means this. First of all, all the vast wonders of cyclic existence are impermanent, like we're talking about. And we have this, this false concept that they will last forever. Because our mind is cooked into this idea that... that uh, this state that we attain can be sustained. And even if we know in the back of our head that it can't, a lot of us still believe it. Because there tends to be this, uh, this, uh, this notion going around in society. It's like, oh, if I can get something that lasts me until I die, then that's basically like being permanent. Except... When you die, it probably isn't going to be that long from now. You got maybe a few decades, and then it's over. 50 years is a lot less than forever. A lot less. And so I'm reminded of all those, uh, all the people who talk about investment in, in, in diversifying your portfolio. And many people get. Uh, uh, Really diversified portfolio all around the world. Billionaires, right? They say like, oh, this is secure. No matter what happens in the world, my, my portfolio will never go down, right? But still, the value of their portfolio to them is all attached to the health of their physical body and their ability to enjoy sensory pleasures, which deteriorates as you age. As you age, the senses become uh, more gross, less astute. And so your ability to enjoy all that wealth is, is less. And then... Even if your portfolio could withstand a war in Saudi Arabia, it probably can't withstand a tick bite in your backyard. Because if you die, all of that is lost. And the other sense in which this is illusory is that we can experience all these wonders, beautiful palaces, like in the picture, only through sensory perceptions. And so, every aspect of reality that we perceive, we only experience it as vibrations through our senses. Vibrations of light, of sound, of touch. We never actually see the person as they are. We only see the light that reflects off that person. And we endow that light with a mental concept of the person. 
I know the name. This person has certain characteristics. But we can't see that person. We only see the senses. We only experience psychic existence through these vibrations. And so we can never get a genuine happiness out of that. Because it's not inherently real. <clears throat> they only have a reality for us because we endow these vibrations with a reality with, uh, within our mind. For instance, my girlfriend speaks Taiwanese. And sometimes she speaks Taiwanese to her, um, uh, her mother. Right? And she's saying these words in Taiwanese, and she could be saying anything. And to me, they're just vibrations of sound. And they have no meaning to me whatsoever. And she could be saying terrible things to me or about me. Right? <laughs> and I would have no idea. And that would have no effect on my psychology at all. Right? <laughs> but if she says the things to me in English, here it is. Vibrations of sound again. But I take these vibrations of sound and I endow them with a, a, with a, a, a different reality because I've been trained in, in how to endow these vibrations with a particular type of, of conceptual framework. And then my girlfriend says things to me and, and I, I feel happy or I feel upset depending on the, the content of these vibrations. Now, if my girlfriend speaks to me in Taiwanese, she might still be feeling the, the, the terrible things about me in her mind when she's saying them to me. But I do not experience those terrible things in her mind. And so every aspect of my reality is just endowed, is, is, is endowed with a reality by my mind. And there's also a scientific basis for how reality is created by the mind. They say in Zen, you must learn to understand that the whole universe is created by mind alone. And in quantum physics, what they're finding is that um, particles, the, the physical reality that we have, only becomes reality, only becomes only manifests itself as an observable reality. As a concrete reality, rather. When it's being observed. Right? And so they say if, they, uh, if, there's, no one, if there's no one observing the, these, uh, the quanta, the particles, right? then they're not particles. They're just this, this probability function. It's a wave. And the particle could be here, it could be there. No one knows. It's not anywhere. Right? It's not just that no one knows where the, where the particle is. It's that the particle really isn't anywhere in particular. It's nowhere in particular. It's just a, just a, it just exists in potentiality. And that potentiality manifests itself when the mind observes it. And so, they're concluding now, they're finally coming to understand <clears throat> that reality itself cannot exist unless consciousness precedes it. Because, if this whole universe is just a, a potential, until it is observed, then the notion that somehow the universe could on its own give rise to, to consciousness, could form and develop until this thing called mind eventually emerges out of the universe, is understood to be an absurdity. Because the universe can't form anything until 
mind observes it. And so consciousness, mind, had to be there before the physical universe. And so those who understand this, those who really grasp the implications of these new revelations in quantum physics, understand that this necessitates the existence of some primordial consciousness or a god. And so some scientists are realizing this now. That there is a scientific foundation for the existence of a god. But most, most people still love to be trapped in their ignorance. Sun Kapa goes on. Attachment ceases when you see pleasant feelings as suffering. Now, this does not mean that you have to hate life. <laughs> but this is an invitation to look into the things that you think make you happy. in order to see them for what they really are. Now, sometimes what happens is that um, the things that we view as pleasant really are just objectively suffering. And um, we're just so conditioned by the egos that we believe them to be pleasant. I can give you an example. So when I was in college, all my friends liked to go to this, this particular dance club, right? And so what they would do was get really, really drunk before they went in, and um, when they go to the club, and then they, they'd imagine that they were having a good time. Now, I never liked going to the dance clubs, but I liked being with my friends, so sometimes I went, to this, uh, I went to this club. But of course I didn't drink, right? And so we go to this club. And everyone's crammed together, so tight that no one can move. And the floor is sticky with something disgusting. I don't know what. And this noise is really loud, right? So you, you can't... It's too, it's too cramped to dance, and it's, it's, too, it's too loud to have a conversation with anyone. And the only thing going through my mind as I'm, as I'm standing at this club is I really, really hope I don't get stabbed by someone with a used, rusty syringe. And so, <laughs> this, whole, this whole experience is just this horrible, mortifying thing, right? But because all my friends were drunk, they didn't understand that this was a terrible experience, and they perceived this suffering to be pleasant. Right? And so sometimes we take things that are actually suffering and we, 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 uh, we, we, we endow them with some sort of a pleasant, uh, pleasant idea about them. Like many times we destroy our bodies with terrible food or, or, or drugs. And, and this is some sort of like really objectively suffering, painful thing. But our consciousness is so conditioned that we perceive it as pleasant. Now what this is saying here is not that there is nothing that we can call pleasant. Or there is no respite from suffering. But rather, it's trying to point out to us so that we can observe in our own experience, that the root nature of pleasant sensations is not happiness. And so we're going to talk a bit about what that, what that root nature is. He says, pleasure does not exist naturally independently of the removal of suffering. And so most of the times when we see something pleasurable... It's really just the cessation of some other type of suffering. It's like when you're carrying something hot, right? And you're carrying the hot thing in your right hand. 
And you're like, oh my God, this is hot. And so you shift it over to your left hand. And so you say, ah, my right hand feels really good now. And you're carrying this thing in your left hand now. You haven't really started to feel that it's, that it's hot yet, right? And so you think, oh, I feel, it feels really good. But then you got the thing in your left hand now, and it starts feeling hot again. And you're like, oh my God, my left hand is really hot. So you shift it over to your right hand, right? And so now you feel, you, you feel like, ah, oh, that feels good now. And so you keep having to shift this thing back and forth between your hands. And so one of the examples that they give in the scriptures is they say like, oh, many people think that uh, if you walk a lot, then sitting down would be pleasant. So you've been walking all day, and you sit down. And um, you say, ah, this seating, this is a pleasurable sensation. Makes me really happy, right? But really, the seat, the being seated is not inherently a pleasurable sensation. It's not inherently happy, right? Because if you stay sitting for, for, for too long, like people who've meditated for a long time, there's a lot of suffering involved there. So you're sitting there for an hour or two hours, like you are in this lecture, and you say, gosh, I'd really just like to stand up and go for a walk, right? And so, he says, yep. where's my other quote? I didn't put it in. Okay. Pleasure when it increases is seen to change into pain. And pain when it increases does not likewise change into pleasure. And so desire is a, is a, is a misdirection. We look at this, the soothing of suffering, which we misinterpret to be happiness, but is really just shifting the burden of the suffering into, into some other type of suffering. And we create illusions about this nature of soothing, thinking that it's actually something, something desirable. When really, there's no pleasurable thing that is pleasurable in and of itself. Everything that we associate with pleasure is really just pleasurable because it's, a, it's the temporary alleviation of some type of suffering. And so if you, if you meditate on the things that you find pleasurable, you'll see that this is true. Look at the things that you think make you happy in life, that you associate with pleasure. And for each of those things, you can usually find the opposite. You can usually find that the, the suffering that is at the root of that pleasure. Because every pleasurable thing has some sort of suffering as its root. Because it is the soothing of some type of suffering. Now, the suffering does not necessarily have to be a physical pain. The example of... of the dual poles of walking and sitting. That's associated with a, a physical pain. But sometimes the pain that we associate with, with, with a pleasure is more internal. It could be a pain associated with a, a sense of self. Because we have this false sense of self, because we're, we're disconnected from our, our, our own divine nature, from our own inner being. We have this, this emptiness inside that causes us suffering. And a lot of times we try to fill that emptiness with, with sensory perceptions to distract ourselves from the suffering that we carry within. And we perceive those sensory perceptions to be pleasurable because it's, take, it's temporarily taking our attention away 
from the suffering that we're carrying on our backs. And so there are many types of pleasures and many types of suffering. But each one of the things that we consider to be pleasure is only so because it, it is the removal of some type of suffering. Pleasure does not exist naturally in and of itself. The root nature of pleasant sensations is not genuine happiness. And so, if you increase the amount of this desirable thing that you have, like in the quote that I read you, pleasure when it increases is seen to change into pain. You'll see that this pleasurable thing is actually just another source of suffering. But we have this ego, right? We have this ego that's always craving for more, always craving for more of this pleasurable thing. And so the ego, with this craving, inevitably leads us to unambiguous suffering. Because the more of these pleasurable things, the more of these sensations we accumulate, the hotter that, that, the, that potato gets in, our, in our, our left hand, and the more the burning that we feel. Samuel talks a bit about genuine happiness and pleasure. And he says, people work daily. They struggle to survive. Somehow they want to exist. However, they are not happy. The word happiness is like Greek to people, as we say around here. However, worst of all is that they know this. But amid so much bitterness, it seems they do not lose the hope of achieving happiness one day without knowing how or in what way. Wretched people, they suffer so much. However, they want to live and are afraid of dying. If people understood something about revolutionary psychology, possibly they would even think differently. But the fact is that they do not know anything. What they want is to survive in the midst of all their misfortune, and that is all. There are pleasant and enjoyable moments, but this is not happiness. People confuse pleasure with happiness. Parties, bar hopping, drinking sprees, and orgies are brutish pleasures but they are not happiness. There are, however, wholesome get-togethers without overindulgence, vulgar behavior and the abuse of alcohol. But that is not happiness either. Are you a kind person? How do you feel when you dance? Are you in love? Is it true love? What do you feel when you dance with the one you love? Allow me to be a little bit cruel for a moment by saying that this is not happiness either. If you are an older person, if you are not attracted to these pleasures, if they leave a bad taste in your mouth, forgive me if I tell you that it would be different if you were young and full of illusions. All in all, in this cruel world in which we live, there are no happy people. All the unfortunate human beings are unhappy. In life, we have met many individuals who are loaded with money and full of problems. They are involved in lawsuits, overtaxed, etc. They are not happy. What is the use of being rich if one does not have good health? Wretched rich people. Sometimes they are more unfortunate than any beggar. Everything passes in this life. Things, people, ideas, etc. Those who have money and those who have none also pass away. Nobody experiences genuine happiness. Happiness is not achieved by running away from the me, the myself, the ego. Instead, it would be interesting to grab the bull by the horns, to observe the eye, to study the eye, in order to discover the causes of suffering. When one discovers the real cause of so much misery and bitterness, it becomes obvious that something can be done. If we manage to eliminate our me, myself, our eye of drinking sprees, our eye of vices, our eye of attachments that cause so much heartfelt sorrow in us, if we manage to eliminate those worries that torment our minds and make us ill, etc., etc., 
And then clearly what arrives is that which is timeless, that which is beyond the body, that which is beyond attachments and beyond the mind, that which is truly beyond our comprehension and is called happiness. Unquestionably, while our consciousness remains trapped within the ego, the me, the myself, the I, in no way will it be able to know genuine happiness. Happiness as a quality that neither the me, the myself, the I, or the ego has ever known. And so he's pointing out here to what we've just been describing, that even things that seem wholesome or beautiful are not happiness at their root. Happiness is something transcendent. It's something profound. It's something beyond the self. And it can only be achieved by passing beyond the self. by experiencing the root nature of the reality that we have within, by experiencing our own inner divinity, our innermost. In the, the Gospel of, uh, of John, it says, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples, indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. To know the truth means to free yourself from your egos and to comprehend the own root nature of your mind, which is the root nature of existence itself. And doing this shall make you free from your sinning egos, from cyclic existence, from samsara. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest you, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, trapped within the egos. And the servant abideth not in the house forever. For whosoever carries the egos within is subject to the suffering of conditionality and will always be subject to causes and conditions. And everything in their life will be impermanent. They cannot abide in the house forever. Nothing that they have is forever. But the Son abideth forever. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. For the Son of God, the Christ, can help free you from sin and cyclic existence. Can help you to destroy your egos. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. The devil is the ego. 
And we who are born of the ego, born of sin and fornication, will pursue the desires of the ego. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh, of, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Because the ego corrupts your perception. The ego is a liar. The ego tells you, you'll be happy if you acquire this. You'll be happy if you become this. You'll be happy if you can be in this place. But none of those things are genuine happiness. The ego only knows how to lie. And it corrupts our perception. It causes us to believe the lie. To see it as the truth. And so when the sun speaks to us the truth... We do not believe it. We see the truth and perceive it to be a lie. Which of you, he says, can convict me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep, if a man keep my saying... He shall never see death because he shall escape the process of cyclic existence, the process of being born and dying. And so I don't want to leave you in this lecture with a, a bout of depression. Gnosis is not about being depressed or being unhappy. Samuel and Vior says, do not worry. Cultivate the habit of being happy. And so this lecture is not to make you miserable. It's to encourage you to investigate what it is that makes you happy. And the Gnostic path is completely in alignment with having a, a pleasing or a happy disposition. And we want to become cognizant of the ways in which we take sources of, of, of happiness, in quotes, or what we call to be happiness, to really just be sensory pleasures. And to understand that true happiness, genuine happiness, is not to be found in the exterior world. Genuine happiness is rooted in God. Genuine happiness is the mind free of any sort of conditioning. The absolute has happiness. And the absolute underlies everyone and everything. It is the foundation of our reality. And so when you strip away all the causes and conditions... When you strip away cyclic existence, all these temporary things, happiness is what remains. But you have to have the courage to remove the aspects of our psychology that we're convinced that we believe are our happiness in order to see the true light that lies within. Do you have any questions? No, that's great. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, talking about pleasurable experiences. Uh huh.
Well, it's exactly what I was what I was describing in the lecture, that you use this this type of experience in order to soothe some aspect of your suffering, right? And so it's it's good and it's fine to do that. There's nothing wrong with with pleasurable sensations. The trouble is that we become attached to those sensations. the The problem is not the sensations themselves. The sensations are just sensations. The trouble is with the, uh, the, the mental attitude that we have to these sensations. The trouble is, is the attachment. And so if you do this and you soothe the suffering, like pouring water on a burn, that's okay. But what typically happens is that we, we, we take this and then we, we develop some sort, of, some sort of attachment to that. And we desire that in the future. And then that leads to further suffering. And so the pendulum will naturally swing. But are we pushing the pendulum? To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.